Well, you know, I'm glad it's soon going to be dark outside because we really have got before us one of those darker stories of the Bible. One of those intriguing characters that fascinates us, frankly, for all the wrong reasons. There was a certain epoch in David's life, you see, once he became king, which was an epoch of conquest. And in that particular epoch, there's one man that clearly stands out, head and shoulders above all others, a man who shines in the record with a light, frankly, all of his own, a man who was the fear and dread of all the surrounding nations, a man who came, who, when it came to issues of tenacity and raw courage, was almost unparalleled in the entire record of Scripture. We're speaking, of course, of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, the captain of the host. He was a brilliant soldier. He was an inspirational commander. He was the man that his own men called him, my Lord Joab. An invincible character in scripture, or so it appeared. And a man, what's more, who loved David, who admired David, and who had an untouchable loyalty to the throne of David and who never wanted to do anything else but serve that throne. What I mean by that is he never wanted to be the king. He just wanted to make sure that that throne survived no matter what, including despite David, no matter what. And and a man, therefore, whilst David was on the throne, who would jeopardize his life time and time and time again in order to protect him. But a man who could never, ever, enter into the true spirit of godliness that motivated David. We're going to see this evening as we look at this man, Joab, though David loved him in a certain manner, and though David benefited greatly from what Joab was able to do, and though Joab was unquestionably loyal to David, David could never have a relationship with him. I mean, they, he loved him. They were relatives. David was Joab's uncle. Job, in many ways, as I say, David's right-hand man, close to everything that he ever did, but in other ways, a hundred miles apart. And over and over again, you see it in the record. In fact, three times you read it in the record. Ye sons of Zeruiah are too hard for me. Three times that phrase is recorded. Well, here they are, these sons of Zeruiah. Here's the wider family of David, in fact, the house of Jesse, David's father. David's, fa- David's mother, it appears, in fact, was married twice. She married first to a fellow called Nahash, and once, it appears, after Nahash died, secondly then to Jesse. By Nahash, David's mother's first husband, she bore two girls, Abigail and Zeruiah. Abigail married a, a fellow, well, in fact, probably didn't marry the fellow called Jetha. Amasa, it tells us, was Abigail's son by Jetha. No hint that there's a marriage there, so there might be something about that relationship that's untoward. Zeruiah, uh, Nahash, Nahash and Jesse's mother's first, uh, second daughter, rather, had three sons in order, Abishai, Joab, and Asahel. And upon the death of Nahash, it appears, this woman married Jesse, who had David and his multitude of brothers. And so you can see David's half-sister was Zeruiah, who was Joab's mother. David, therefore, was Joab's uncle, though they were probably much the same age. In fact, David might have even been younger than Joab because he was at the end of the family. And Joab came from a family which was long, perhaps, before the commencement of David's family. So it may be that their ages are similar, even though, as I say, David is Uh, Joab's uncle. Well, similar in age, but in other ways, as we say, very, very different. Let's now talk about the family of Zeruiah. Zeruiah means wounded, and it comes from a root to crack under pressure. And this seems to have been her. I mean, these boys were each the sons of Zeruiah. So the characteristic that these men had, had come from their mother. They were just like her. 
So she's made them what they were. She's made them the hard men that they were because she ruled them, it appears, with an iron fist. And she's brought them up tough, under pressure. I mean, tough. I mean, wild tough. Independent boys in the very image of their mother. Abishai the eldest. Born to be a soldier, you know. No, no question. Born to be a soldier. There's nothing more obvious about him. He's mentioned among the mighty men of David in 2 Samuel chapter 23, standing in the battle with David, lifting up his spear against 300 men who he wiped out. Fiercely loyal to David, on call day or night. He's got a statement he makes whenever the job needs to be done, like whenever a dirty job needs to be done. Do you know what it was? I'll only hit him once. I'll only hit him once. Like, this is a professional soldier, like you've never seen a professional soldier. If he had to try strike somebody twice to take their life, he wouldn't count the hit. That's what he was like. Big as a tank, just about as smart, but that was Abishai. His brother Joab, the man who loved David, the man who admired David as a hero, you know, we did the reading this afternoon of the battle at the Valley of, uh, the Valley of Elah with David and Goliath, and we reflected as, in our group, as perhaps you did, uh, upon the fact that Jonathan loved David for what had happened down on that valley floor, not because he killed the giant, but why he killed the giant. And, and the speech he made, I mean, think of the battle. It was almost a scripted battle where Goliath waits for David to say his piece. David waits for Goliath to say his piece, and then when they've both said their piece, like in safety from each other, then they run at each other and go, go for it. Well, Jonathan loves David because of what David did on that valley floor. But Jonathan wasn't the only one watching, was he? David's own nephew, Joab, also saw that battle. And there's no question about the, about the love that Joab had for David. It was David's courage that supremely motivated Joab. Like Abishai, Joab, it appears, was a man who had never really known fear. Grown up all his life, brought up under the fist of the Iron Lady, never been afraid of anything, really. Everything was just another conquest, and that's how the record paints him. But unlike Abishai, there was a finer side to Joab, a more intellectual, I say finer, finer in a worldly sense, a more intellectual side. To Joab. It wasn't all bloodshed. You see, there was something about Joab that wasn't present in the others. He had a certain refinement of character, a certain ability to walk off the battlefield, hose himself down, and walk straight into parliament and deliver a speech. Abishai could not do that, but Joab could do that. He was eloquent as well as dangerous, ruthless and dignified in a funny way at the same time. And then there was Asahel, the baby of the family. Slim, it appears, athletic, fleet of foot like a wild roe. I mean, a born marathon runner, wasn't he? Could run what, like the wind, mile after mile after mile, as he did when he chased down Abner to his death. He died chasing Abner, a foolish act, because a foolish act, in fact, which ended what could have been a marvellous career because he wants the old general's armour. It was pride that killed Asahel. He was one of David's mighty men, even at a very young age, and dies prematurely. Amasa, David's cousin, sorry, Joab's cousin. David's half-cousin, if you like, in, in a sense. As I say, perhaps born illegitimately because of the way well, it never says Abigail married Jetha, only that he, that he was an Ishmaelite that took her. That's how the record describes it. So you've got to wonder exactly what that might mean. Nevertheless, he also joined David in the wilderness, it appears, and, well, from perhaps the genetics of uh, the wife of Jesse, uh, she also, uh, he also inherits a certain military ability. Wasn't as smart as Joab wasn't as capable in any respect, wasn't respected by his men as a leader like Joab was, but nevertheless, a very, very capable 
soldier in a personal sense. He supported Absalom and Absalom's bid for the throne. That was a problem. He was made the general of Absalom's army. After Joab killed Absalom, David was so outraged at Absalom's death at the hand of Joab that he appoints Amasa, the captain of the army, in Joab's place. That lasted about as long as it took for Joab to kill Amasa. You want to think about Joab's life then. So I'm now, I've now introduced you to some of the major characters in the, in the play. You want to think about Joab's life. This is how I suggest you should think about it. It's a life of three epochs. He had the top job, that is the top military job in the nation. But he had to get it three times because he was fired twice. The first epoch begins in the wilderness where everything starts, let's call it, when David first amasses his fledgling army in the cave of Adullam, what, 1 Samuel 22. The family came to him, so you've got to presume at that time that that's when Joab first hooks up with David as David's fleeing for his life and needs military protection from Saul because Saul's pursuing him with an army. David then takes Hebron, and uh, Abner comes to make a deal with David, which we'll look at in a moment, and Joab kills Abner. David is so outraged at what was evidently the murder of Abner that he fires Joab on the spot and says, we're going to go and take Jerusalem. Whoever can get up the gutter and take that city and open the doors and let us in, he will be the general. Well, Joab says, well, sure, I'll have a go at that, at which point there were no other contenders. Joab climbs up, opens up Jerusalem, gets the job back. So he was David's, if you like, de facto captain when David was running around the wilderness He's in control of things by the time you come to 2 Samuel after the death of Saul. He's fired in 2 Samuel 2. He's back in the top job in 2 Samuel chapter 5 after they take Jebus. Well, David has certain misadventures, as you know, in his family. Sins with Bathsheba, that causes enormous trouble for his boys. Uh, Absalom kills Amnon, Absalom flees, Absalom comes back. Absalom, uh, well, commences a rebellion David pleads that they save Absalom's life. My son, my son, you know. Second and Samuel 18, Joab executes Absalom and is fired again from his job as captain of the host. David puts, there's a, there's a rebellion of Sheba, the son of Bichri. Uh, David puts Amasa in place as the general in Joab's place until Joab kills Amasa, and resumes control of the top job. You see, only ever wanted one position in Israel would not tolerate any competition for that position and had that job in three epochs because he was fired twice. An unstoppable man, a voraciously competitive man, an unbelievably courageous man. And nobody wanted to get in Joab's way. Come with me to 2 of Samuel, chapter 2. Let's begin here. Because this is where some of these larger-than-life characters now step onto the stage and start to fight each other. Here's the first epoch of Job's employment as the captain of the host. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. This is the beginning of David's kingdom. Saul has just died, you remember, in 1 Samuel 31. It came to pass after this that David inquired of Yahweh, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And Yahweh said to David, Go up. David says, Whither shall I go up? And God said, Unto Hebron. Now, it's remarkable, you know, Circumstances are now made for David to walk into Israel and to establish his kingdom because Saul is dead and David is increasing in popularity. Men are coming to him every day to support him. The house of David is waxing stronger and stronger, but he doesn't make assumptions. He just take things into his own hands. David, you remember, was anointed by Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16, many, many, many years before he would ever become king. And the purpose of that, I believe, was to tell him that he was going to become king 
so that he knew that he would survive all the trials which would subsequently come upon him, those trials being, of course, the uh, near-death experiences he would continually have with Saul. How would God take a man, give him all the accolades that human society can ever endear upon a person, prepare him to be the king of the nation, and still keep him a humble servant of God at the same time? Well, there's only one way. Give him unmitigated success, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands, everything he touches turns to gold, and then send him out into the wilderness to run for his life against a man who's going to kill him, but upon whom which David cannot touch one finger, but has to rely upon God. That's how God did it. And having had that training now, when David has got the path opened up before him in 2 Samuel chapter 2, he still depends upon God before he opens doors which would naturally appear to be open before him. Shall I go up? Yes. Which city first? Hebron. Well, here's the uh, map of how things look. There's Hebron down there, just south of Jerusalem, halfway down the west bank, if you like, of the Dead Sea. That's where David's going to begin his kingdom from, the city of Hebron. So David went up thither, it says, and his two wives uh, also, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite, and his men that were with him did David bring up. So here's Joab and his friends, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Hebron, of course, one of the great cities of antiquity. Abraham lived there after God told him to walk through the length and breadth of the land. It was the place that Joshua gave to Caleb, wasn't it? Which he took from the sons of Anak. It was one of the six cities of refuge in the land, three on each side of the Jordan River. And finally, when Joshua appointed the 48 Levitical cities around the land, Hebron was one of those, given to the sons of Aaron. It was the city of the high priest. It was in Judah where David began his kingdom, a city of enormous significance. But don't forget a city of refuge. Not just the city of the high priest, but also a city of refuge. It becomes important later. Well, verse 4, it says that the men of Judah then came and they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. Now, what's happening here in verse 4? The men of Judah have come and anointed him. Well, Samuel, you see, previously, back in 1 Samuel 16, anointed David in his family, in the presence of his family. Now he's anointed in the presence of his tribe. When he takes Jerusalem in chapter 5, verse 3, he'll be anointed a third time in the presence of the nation. Because by chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, he rules the entire nation. The house of Saul is completely gone. Well, now things get complicated. Because verse 8 tells us, that Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. When, Ab when Abner, you see, sees David beginning to sol consolidate his kingdom in Hebron, he's looking to keep the house of Saul under his control. Now, Abner was a different man to Joab. Joab was happy to have David on the throne and would support David in whatever venture was most inclined or most calculated to maintain the throne of David. Abner, he wanted the throne of Saul for himself. And he'll put any kind of puppet on there that he thinks the people will need, but he himself was the power behind the throne. Evidently, in the case of Ishbosheth, and definitely, as I'll show you, in the case of Saul. Saul, for many years, was a puppet under the control of Abner. Joab never controlled David like that. Joab loved the throne, but was, was, was happy to simply be the general, never wanted the throne for himself. Abner wanted the throne for himself. A difference, you see, between Joab and Abner, worth pointing out. It comes to me to chapter 3, verse 7 of 2 of Samuel. This is what Abner knows. So he's going to go and he's going to establish the throne of Saul in Mahanaim. Two camps, Mahanaim means. Hebron means fellowship where David is, and Joab, uh, uh, Mahanaim where Abner is means two camps. So he's, he's happy to split the ecclesia in order to facilitate what he wants in life. 
And in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 7, it tells you just how much Abner knew about events. Saul had a concubine, you see, whose name was Rizpah. Saul, of course, is dead. Had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aya. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore, Abner, hast thou gone into my father's concubine? And Abner, well, the simple answer is, because I want to take your father's throne. That's the answer to the question. But Abner's very wrath in verse 8 for the words of Ishbosheth, because he, and he said, Who do you think you're talking to, you kid? Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father, to his brethren, to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, but thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? So Abner's affronted, Abner's outraged. Look, he has crossed the line. You remember when when, um, Adonijah asked if he could marry Abishag, who was the young girl that warmed David's bed. There was never any physical relationship between David and Abishag. She was never his wife. She was quite some distance. Solomon says, kill him. He marries her. He's got designs on the throne. She was not David's concubine. Abner has taken Saul's concubine. It's evident what Abner wants. And Ishbosheth points the finger at him. And all Abner can do is be affronted and outraged. Well, he's been caught, hasn't he? He's been caught. But look what he says, verse 9. So do God to Abner and more also, except as Yahweh hath sworn to David, even so I do to him, to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Abner knows that David ought to be the man ruling a united Israel. He knows that he's contradicting the commandment of God. And when Ishbosheth points out the fact that Abner's got designs on Saul's throne, Abner says, Well, Ishbosheth, you want to play it that way? I'll give the throne to David because I know that's what God intends anyway. Look at the outrage of the man, look at the audacity of the man to be deliberately fooling around with the purpose of God and stalling it for his own aggrandizement. That was Abner, you see. Blind, ruthless ambition. Here's Abner. One word, one word to describe Abner? Ambition. Abner means father of light. He was Saul's uncle, captain of Saul's army, at least while Saul was alive. A valiant man, the record describes him as, and he was. I mean, you understand... Don't fool around with Abner. Don't trust Abner. You shake hands with Abner, count your fingers when you're finished. Just be very careful dealing with Abner. He was Saul's personal bodyguard and incited, repeatedly incited, as I'll show you shortly, Saul against David. He was the real power behind the throne of Saul. He supports Ishbosheth after Saul is dead, as we've just read in chapter 2 and verse 8 of 2 Samuel. He challenges the throne of Ishbosheth by marrying Saul's concubines. He knows the promises to David that David should rule the land and the house of Saul should have its demise. He's the one that kills Asahel with the back end of the spear in 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 23. He's going to make a league with David in 2 Samuel chapter 3, and he's finally going to be killed by the two brothers, Joab and Abishai. It was murder when Job kills Abner. But let me tell you, it's better for Israel that Abner's dead. Joab can see that. But Job is the sort of man for whom every day, every day, the end justifies the means. He's a man of enormous foresight. There's no question about that. But he really doesn't care how he gets from A to B. And there's a problem there. And let me show you about Abner. I've made this comment you can see it on the slide there. He incites Saul against David. Come back with me to second, sorry, to first of Samuel 26. This is why Job hates Abner. And this is why Abner has to die. And this is why Abner is the power behind the throne of Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 12. We're back in the wilderness wanderings, if you like, of David, running around. Uh, for his life, in fear of his losing his life from Saul and Saul's army. 
And there is an occasion that uh, David goes down and Saul's sleeping in his camp. And it says in verse 12 of 1 Samuel 26 that David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster or his pillow. And they get them away. No man saw it, nor knew it, neither awaked. They were all asleep because a deep sleep from Yahweh was fallen upon them. Now, who is the person in verse 12 that goes with David? When it says, and they got away, they get, who, who's the they? Well, one is David. Who's the other one? Well, you find out in verse 9. It's their old friend Abishai. You want the job done, David? I'm here 24 7, day or night, just say. Well, they take the spear, so they confiscate Saul's spear. And then in verse 13, David went over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off, a great space now being between him and Saul. And verse 14 says, he cries to the people, to Saul's whole army, so he's now going to wake them all up in the dead of the night from the hilltop, out of range. He cries to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner. Now, why? Why Abner? Well, because, of course, it was Abner's job to protect Saul, and Saul could have lost his life in verse 12. If, as I might suggest to you, if David hadn't stopped Abishai, Abishai immediately would have taken Saul's life. Answerest thou not, Abner, he says in verse 14. Then Abner answers and said, Who is it that cries to the king? So this big voice would come up from the floor of the valley. This angry bear just been woken up at midnight. Verse 17, they have the conversation. And Saul knew David's voice and says, Is it thy voice, my son David? David said, It is my voice, O Lord, my Lord, O King. And he said, Wherefore doth my Lord pursue after his servant? Why do you keep chasing me, Saul? David says, What evil have I done? What evil's in my hand? And look at verse 19. Now, therefore, Saul, I pray thee, let my lord, the king's servant. So here's David from the top of the hill, shouting down the valley, to the valley below. Abner standing there like this, looking up at him. Saul, like this. All the men watching, what, like this, up down. Listen to what I'm saying, says David. If Yahweh has stirred thee up against me, then let him accept an offering. If I've committed a sin against God, then I'll address it with God, he says. But if they be the children of men, then cursed be they before Yahweh. If God has set you on to me, I'll offer an offering to God. But if the children of men have set you on to me, then let God curse them. What's he talking about? He's talking about Abner. He's talking about, David knows what's going on. Why is Saul pursuing David? Because Abner keeps inciting Saul to pursue David, you see. Cursed be they before Yahweh, for they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of Yahweh, saying, go serve other gods. You're forcing me out of the country. And it's Abner that's done it. It's Abner that's doing it, he says. And you can imagine that big man standing at the bottom of the valley, seething with rage as he hears this allegation from David, which, of course, he knows to be true, and now so do all the rest of Saul's army. It was pretty clear now to everyone who was the power behind the throne of Saul. Well, as we know, as I say, from verse 8 and 9 of this chapter, Abner, sorry, uh, David doesn't go down to Saul and Abner alone. There was another man with him, this other man we know very well, Abishai. And if ambition would be the salient title of Abner's character, what would you say of Abishai? Well, it would have to be strength, wouldn't it? Abishai means father of generosity. He was David's nephew, as we've found, and probably joined David in the cave of Adullam when David's wider family came to him at that time. A loyal man, a courageous man. Verse 6 tells you of this chapter. Abishai, the son of Zerah, brother to Joab, who will go down with me, to, to, with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai says, I will go down with thee. Like always first to volunteer to help David. Extremely loyal. And had undaunted pride in his military professionalism. I mentioned it already, but here's verse 8 of 1 Samuel 26. Abishai says to David, David, he says, 
Look at the situation we're in. It's the middle of the night. They're all there asleep. I mean, I can hear them. I can smell them. God has delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now, therefore, David, let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear to the earth at once, and I will not smite him a second time. You won't even hear a peep. I'll just stop his heart at any tick of the clock, and we'll do the business, and we'll leave. Just let me do it. Now, of course, this is 1 Samuel 26. It's hard on the heels of 1 Samuel 24, where David went into the, was, and his men were hiding in the cave, and Saul comes into the mouth of the cave to attend to his business, and David goes and snips off a piece of the skirt of, of Saul's garment. And you've got to say, and having done so, then Saul leaves, and, and David having done so, it, it smites his conscience that he's done this thing. Now, why? Why would it have done so? I mean, he just cut off a piece... And I've heard various explanations for this, but I, I, I like this one. Paint the picture. Uh, David and his men are in the cave. Saul comes into the front of the cave. David and his, they're, they're running from Saul, and there's a lot of those men, including this big fellow here, who would like nothing more than to execute that problem right there and then. David goes up to him and cuts off a piece of his gun. Well, I'm going up this with scissors. I guess he used a saw, a sword. What was the risk David took? Well, the risk was, of course, that Saul would sense the movement and see David. If Saul had seen David, what would have happened? Well, what do you suppose those men were doing in the cave? What, would standing back here smoking sick? What do you think they were doing? What's going to happen if Saul sees David? He took Saul to within this far of death, didn't he? Stupid thing to have done. And Abner at that time, they say to him, let's just kill him. David says, no, you shan't touch Yahweh's anointed. Well, Ab this is why, sorry, Abner, Abishai. This is why Abishai says here, okay, it's just you and me. Look that way. I'll only hit him once. Like, this is the professional soldier par excellence, isn't it? Unbelievable. I told you, you like him all for the wrong reasons, don't you? <laughs> but this is what he's like, Abner. Extremely loyal. Participates in the, well, saves David's life more than once, and participates in the murders of Abner and probably Amasa. Dies, it appears, he disappears from the record, dies prior to the re rebellion of Adonijah, and he was one of those men that were two, three times too hard for me, too hard for me, just too hard for me, ye sons of Zeruiah. And that was Abner. Well, sorry, that was, I'm sorry, Abishai. But there was one man even greater than him. And if Abner was driven by ambition and Abishai was driven by strength, what do you make of this man here? Raw courage. Absolutely raw courage. Even, you know, before Joab comes on the, sun, on the scene, we're in the first of Samuel chapter 26, and we meet Abishai in first of Samuel chapter 26 as the man who puts up his hand to go down with Joab into the valley and deal with Saul, whatever that might have meant when they got there. But he's not even introduced as Abishai. Do you remember how he's introduced to us? Oh, yes, the name Abishai appears, but look at verse 6 of 1 Samuel 26. When you first meet Abishai, he doesn't even stand on his own two feet, and he's one of the greatest men in David's army. He's Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, brother to Joab. So even when you first meet this man who's a full-grown adult and can clearly handle himself in most situations, he's still the brother to Joab. No question about the charisma and the control of this man Joab. Remarkable. Okay, come back to 2 Samuel chapter 2 where we were. Let's see. Let's see Joab. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12 is the first mention in the record of Joab personally. I mean, I know we mentioned him back in 1 Samuel 26, but only, only by way of 
well, it's a reference to him, but not to him personally in that sense, is it? In verse 12, here he comes. Abner the son of Ner and the servants of Ishbosheth the son of Saul went up from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab the son of Zeruiah and the servants of David went out and they met together by the pool of Gibeon. They sat down, the one on one side of the pool, the other on the other side of the pool. So here is the first record that you read of Joab in battle, in physical conflict. And by now, he is clearly recognized as the commander of David's army because nobody else can touch him. He's just far too dangerous a man. Abner's decided they should play a little game and rather than have the two armies directly engage, find 12 strong men from each side and pit them one against the other. Really, it was a mock contest between Abner and Joab. Now, Abner, under no circumstances, did Abner and Joab want to fight. As good as Joab was, he is very well aware that Abner is an extremely proficient soldier, and even if he was to have killed Joab in conflict, he would come out with mortal wounds. There is no, under no circumstances can these two meet each other with fair warning and expect both to live. They'll kill each other. And that's exactly what happens here. I think that's exactly the meaning of this. Those 12 men, each grabs his brother, in go the swords, and all 24 fall down dead. As far as Job and Abner were concerned, they were equally matched, equally dangerous, equally fearless. Well, that's what happens around the pool of, I mean, ridiculous bloodshed. As a consequence of that and the stalemate that therefore ensued when 12 killed 12, uh, then it's full-on conflict between the two armies. And as you know, the army of Job is victorious against the army of Saul, or of Abner now. Abner flees. Joab chases Abner. Uh, There comes a point where Abner says to Joab, how long shall the bitters of war continue, Joab? Give it a rest. Well, Joab says, if you hadn't have said that, I would have pursued you to morning and run you down. But you've said it. He blows the trumpet. They all go home. Both sides licking their wounds. Joab having lost relatively few men, Abner having lost a considerable number of men. Uh, But there was one other thing that happened. In verse 17, it tells us, there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. And there were three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. And Asahel was as light of foot as a wild roe, like he could run like the wind, it's clear. And Asahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Abner looks behind him and says, Art thou Asahel? He says, I am. Abner says, Turn aside, young man, to the right or to the left. Lay hold on one of the young men and take thee his armour. So you can see what's on Asahel's mind, and Abner well knows it. You're not going to take this off me, fella. Now, Abner had the general's armour. And it was quite a trophy if Asahel could have got it. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. Abner says again, I'm telling you, turn aside from following me. Why do, you, why do you want me to go and kill you and then have to face your brother? Because that's what the conflict is really going to materialize in. Asahel won't listen. Well, he catches up with Abner. I mean, this big fellow lumbering along like this, he's running. He's fit enough. But goodness me, this, this kid's as fast as the wind. But he's an inexperienced soldier, isn't he, against the old general. And there comes a moment when Abner's looking in his rearview mirror and he sees this kid coming up behind him and he just leans back like this with the spear and in it goes. Now, probably not necessarily intending to mortally wound him, gets him in here with the back end of the spear. Now, the the front of the spear, of course, was sharp with a spear point, but the back end was a blunt point because they would stick it into the ground like this rather than have him lying on the ground at night. Uh, would, would do the damage. Well, the consequence is, of course, that Asahel does die from that wound. Abner goes on, l- leaves the kid there wallowing in his blood, uh, but now excites the ire of Joab, which will not be quenched until Abner loses his life. Joab means Yahweh is my father. Well, uh, what do you make of that? Vain hope from mum, I suppose. He was David's nephew. 
probably, as I say, joined David at Adullam, much like his brother Abishai. A valiant and courageous man was Joab, the commander-in-chief of David's army. Three times, three times the commander-in-chief of David's army because he got fired twice, feared by his enemies. I've got a reference there of 1 Samuel 11 and verse 17. It's quite a reference. In 1 Samuel chapter 11, it tells us about the incident where Joab spent six months in Edom wiping out the Edomites. The king's son, the, the son of the king of Edom, was rescued for his own safety and he was taken to Egypt that he might grow up in Egypt. He grew up in Egypt and would only come back to Edom where, in his own words, once Job, the son of Zeruiah, was dead. He wouldn't even go back to his own home country until Job, the son of Zeruiah, was dead. So when you talk about feared by his enemies, you've got people who won't even leave one country and go back to their own country if Job is still... Job doesn't even live in Edom. But the moment he decides to cross the border, no one's safe in Edom, and that's what this king knew. He won't leave the protection of Egypt until Job's dead. That's the terror that Job was able to strike into the hearts of the enemies around about David. Because why? Well, because Job was the one that conducted David's seven military campaigns, one of which was against Edom. Ruthless and unemotional. Asked to kill Uriah the Hittite in battle? No problem. He just programs it in as if it's just another attack. Cunning. You know, it was Joab's cold-blooded ruthlessness which would save David time and time again. When Abner comes to David, David would, accept, would have accepted him, and Joab puts an end to that. Absalom, David pleads for the young lad's life. Poor young lad, he was 30-something years old. Pleads for his life, but David's in an emotional wreck. Job, frankly, does the only sensible thing. Amasa, instrumental in Absalom's revolt, could not be trusted. David trusts him. Job doesn't trust him and removes him from the scene. Abner, Absalom, and Amasa all deserve to die. All were serious threats to the stability of the nation. It was right that Job got rid of them, but not the way Job got rid of them. As I say, the end justified the means. He did the right thing, but in altogether the wrong way. He murdered them, all three of them. But a very decisive statesman. After the death of Absalom in 2 Samuel chapter 19, David goes to pieces. Job goes in and almost bullies him back into self-control. Like he's pretty tough on David and talks pretty straight and reads in the riot act and says, pull yourself together, man, which David subsequently does. But a very wily opportunist. What do you think, what it, was, what it, what do you think it was that made Job join the revolution of Adonijah late in David's life? Well, here's something you've got to know about Joab. He was loyal to David all his life and then flips and becomes loyal, as you can see, to Abnijah. What was Joab's true loyalty then? Because it clearly wasn't just to David. And the answer is he was loyal always to the throne of David. He never wanted that throne for himself. But whoever he thought the rightful king was to take that throne, he would support that king to his own hurt. And the day came when David started to lose, lose it as, as far as Job was concerned and needed to be replaced. And Job, well, he backs the wrong horse, but he always backed the throne of David. That was what Job served. Never, as I say, never wanted it for himself, but always supported that throne. Well, got that part wrong was subsequently sentenced to death under Solomon. And he also, as his brother, three times in the record, was too hard for David. But what a man. An enormous support to David when things were going well, when he considered that David was making the right decisions. But when David began to make the wrong decisions in Joab's eyes and do things that were detrimental to the throne of David, well then, 
David had to go to. Because at all cost, that throne would be maintained. Do you know, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we have a lot spoken about the throne of David, and the man that would ultimately take that throne of David after the overturning should finish, that man would be both the son of David and the son of God. That would be the true inheritor of the throne of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jaib was nothing like him. He supported the throne, but for all the wrong reasons. He was nothing like David, and he's nothing like the greater than David who would ultimately take that throne. And as a consequence of that, the true inheritor of that throne, the Lord, will have no use for men like Joab, will he? But that was Joab, you see. He fought the battles of the truth with unbounded energy. Uh, I dare say, there would be many days that he might rather, might rather have stayed home than to have gone out with the army in the rain, in the mud, in the cold. He would have gone out again and his cuts and bruises would not yet have healed, but he'd get up and he'd do it. I mean, he was just absolutely unstoppable. And enormous discipline, and enormous stamina, and enormous courage, and enormous foresight, but a, an unbridled war horse out of control. And there was nothing you could do to appeal to a spiritual side of Joab. But goodness me, do not get in his way. He loved power. He loved control. He would not brook any opposition for that position. And he would support that throne till the day he died. Chapter 3, 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 says... There was a long war now between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Abner can see that the house of Saul is on the decline, and it's going to, at some point, fall to pieces. Well, he makes a dash at the throne, as we've read in the middle verses of this chapter, and has this conflict with Ishbosheth, realizes that that's not really going to go anywhere, so now decides to turn the entire throne of Saul, such as it was, over to David, and essentially join David's side. Well, in verse 21 of this chapter, David agrees to a league with Abner. The absolutely wrong thing to do. Abner would be a toxic influence on the throne of David and would have aspirations for it himself. Joab knew that. Joab could see that everywhere. David couldn't. David, you know, to a fault would take people at face value and give them the benefit of the doubt. Well, you might say that's a laudable characteristic, but it isn't always wise, and it wasn't wise here. Now, there's no question, Abner's Abner's dealing honestly in in his discussions with David, but you just could never trust the wily Abner, you see. Well, verse 22 tells us that the servants of David and Joab come in from pursuing a troop, and Joab finds out about the discussion that subsequently happened between David and Abner. Well, he hits the roof. And, I might say, with good cause. What do you think you're doing, you idiot? Making an arrangement with this fellow? Okay, thanks. Leave it to me. Now, David doesn't know what what, uh, Job's going to do. But you know what Job does. Verse 27. When Abner was returned, so Joab sends messengers to Abner, says, hey, come back, come back. We we need to talk about the the small print, Abner. Well, Abner uh, comes in his simplicity, of all things, for a man like Abner. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, it says in verse 27, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. So Job knows what sort of man he's like, but he's got this vendetta. Now, this is ridiculous. Asahel brought it upon himself. It was unjust to kill Abner for the sake of Asahel. It was right that Abner shouldn't be involved, that that, that Abner should be... At some point, Abner's got to be killed, but not for that. And not there. Do you remember what I told you about Hebron? It was a city of refuge, It was the place you could go to if you accidentally killed someone so that the avenger of blood didn't take your life before the case was heard. Well, where do you think it would have gone if Joab had charged Abner with murder 
and they'd gone before the bar of the priests in Hebron, what would the priest have said? They would have said it was self-defense. Asahel was going to attack Abner. It wasn't murder. And that would have been what it was, would have been said in the gate of Hebron. Asahel lost his life in war. And Job kills Abner in the gate of Hebron in the city of refuge. This is an outrage. Why would Job do it? Well, well because the end justifies the means, you see. And he will do whatever it takes in ecclesial life to achieve the end. Because he's not loyal to the truth, he's loyal to a family or a person or an ecclesia or a brand of some kind. The problem with that, of course, is that Jesus said, he that loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. The Lord would never, ever have any use for a man like Joab, who only served the cause, any cause, but not the right cause. Well, David responds to this, as I say, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 3, and he fires Joab from office. It doesn't tell you that. I mean, David, David's clearly outraged as you start to read 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 33. Did Ed the dies, a fool dies? He was taken in his simplicity by a wicked man. So David then makes the proclamation. Anybody want the general's job? We're going to take Jerusalem next. Whoever can do that, they can have the general's job. Job says, oh, no problem, I'll do that. As I said, I've told you the story. No contest. He goes, how did he get up that shaft, by the way? How did he? Clawed his way up somehow, bursts into the city, charges through the streets, pulls the bolt across the gate, flings the gate open, and in David's army, how does a man do that? And come out unscathed. The fact is, he deserves the job. No one can do what Joab can do. But goodness me, do you really want a person like that on your team in ecclesial life? I mean, he is a war horse, and when the war's finished, he's simply going to look for another conflict. And if there is no conflict, he's going to create one. Do you really want this sort of man on your side? But don't get in his way. That's fatal. Well, Joab's got the top job again after 2 Samuel chapter 5. Come with me to 2 Samuel chapter 18. I'm watching the clock. That's about all I'm doing, actually, is watching it. Um, <laughs> bit of uh, honesty there. Um, 2 Samuel 18 and verse 5. <laughs> Absalom's going to die in this chapter. Absalom has now revolted against David. And Job can see very clearly that David has lost control of himself and his emotions in regard to this young man. And the king commands everyone, verse 5, and commands Joab, Abishai, Ittai, saying, deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captain's charge concerning Absalom. Colour it in. All the people heard when all the captains were given charge. There was no ambiguity about what David required. Does Job care? No, Job doesn't care. Verse 11, they find Absalom caught in a tree. Great oak, it says in verse 9. And Job said to the man that told him about that, Behold, thou sawest him. Why didn't you just smite him there to the ground? I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. A girdle is a belt. I would have given you a flash belt that you could put nicks in it for every kill. And the man said, and this is a telling discussion, isn't it? The man said to Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king can, can charge thee and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise, I should have wrought falsehood against my own life. For there is no matter hid for the king. And, note, Thou thyself would have set thyself against me. Even you wouldn't have defended me. I would have been on my own if I'd done what you said. Now Job knows that's right. He knows that's right. And look at his answer. Ah, I may not tarry. Get out of here. I may not tarry thus with thee. Well, he's exposed, isn't he? Just like Abner was exposed a few chapters earlier. 
that young man's got it right. That's what Job was like. No one, everyone feared him and no one trusted him. Well, it tells you that he takes three darts in verse 14. Why would he take these three darts? And he's going to flick these three darts straight into Absalom's chest and Absalom's going to die in that tree. What do you think was happening here? Job, of course, always has ulterior motives. He kills people who are a threat to the throne, but he's got vendettas against everyone. And he had a grievance against Abner back in chapter 3. He's got a grievance against this young man here as well. Boom, in goes the first dart. That's for taking on your father and starting a revolution. Boom, in goes the second one. That's for treating me like your servant and expecting me to come at your beck and call. Boom. And that's for burning down my field. You, <laughs> you don't do that to me. And Absalom dies. David finds out, of course, that Absalom's dead and probably finds out why. Gives, fires Joab again and gives the job to Amasa. The problem was that Amasa had chosen Absalom's side. Amasa couldn't be trusted. Chapter 19 and verse 13, there's a, a problem. Sheba, the son of Bic, I mean, the whole nation's quite unstable now after Absalom's revolt. Sheba, the son of Bichri, decides he's going to take David on. Amasa, you're the boss. Go and chase, assemble an army and go and chase down Sheba, the son of Bichri. Well, it's a remarkable story. They get up to, was it Abel, Abel Beth Maaka? Uh, Job's going to deal with, with the massa. And then Job goes up to the city and he says, hey, I'm looking for Sheba. Is he in there? Mm, yes, he's in here with his army. Well, Job prepares to besiege the city. And a mother in Israel looks over the wall. You remember the story? What, what does Job say? <laughs> Throw him down. Actually, I only, want this, I only want the part from here up. Throw that part down. And over the wall comes the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and Job breaks the siege and goes home. But not before he's killed Amasa. And in chapter 20, in verse 6, this is how it happens. David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do more harm to us than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. And they went after him, Joab's men. Now, Joab's not allowed to be the leader of the army because Amas is the leader of the army. So Job says to Abishai, well, I can't. my hands are tied, Abishai. How about you take the army and pursue Sheba? So Abishai takes the army to pursue Sheba, but what's the army called? Verse 7, Joab's men. I mean, as soon as he in the room, he took control of the room. That's what Job was like. And off they went. Uh, they come to the great stone in verse 8, which was at Gibeon, and Amasa went before them. And, and Job's garment that he had put on was girded unto him, and upon the girdle with the sword fastened upon his loins, in the sheath thereof, as he went forth, it fell out. So he's got his sword in the scabbard, and he's got a garment loosely tied, deliberately so, and uh, he, 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 he bends over like this, the sword falls out, it hits the ground, he goes to pick it up to make like he's simply going to put it back in his sword and he gets a little close to Amasa and plants it under the fifth rib. And look at the discussion, verse 9. Job said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? And Job took Amasa by the bed with the right hand to kiss him, but Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Job's hand, so he smote him there in the fifth rib and shed out his bowels, like he disemboweled him. They were cousins, those two. But this is Job, you see. Now, he also could not afford to take Amasa on in a fair contest, any more than he could take Abner on in a fair contest. It would be mutually assured destruction for these men to face each other. So, of course, he doesn't. He does it by deceit and by guile. Only when David's on his deathbed does Job change horses and backs Adonijah. And I'll give you my last quote. 1 Kings chapter 2. This is the death sentence now 
on Joab. First of Kings chapter 2, verse 1. You have in these words that I'm going to read you some of, in fact, the most graphic descriptions of the, of the carnage that Joab wreaks when he goes into battle. Verse 1, it says in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, The days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, Son, I go the way of all the earth. Make the following arrangements. Verse 5. Moreover, and look at this verse carefully. Thou knowest also what Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the hosts of Israel, unto Abner the son of Ner and Amasa the son of Jether. Now what does that mean? You know what he's done to me, that is, in killing Absalom. And unto Abner in killing him, and unto Amasa in killing him. He killed well, the three A's, wasn't it? He killed three key people in Israel, all of whom, I'm suggesting, needed to be killed, but not the way he did it. And he shed the blood of war in peace. He put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. Draw the picture of that. It's like a butcher shop, isn't it? So he goes into war like this, and the blood hits the front and fills up his gumboots, doesn't it? And he walks around for the rest of the day sloshing in other men's blood. That's the picture that David has of Joab. So what did he look like when he came in from battle? That's the man we're talking about. He literally wades through a welter of blood to establish the kingdom of David, doesn't he? And to defend it. An unbelievable description in verse 5 of 1 Kings 2. And what was he like? Well, this is what he was like. He would greet somebody with a kiss and kill them. He was condemned in the temple just like Judas was. He slew Innocent blood, 1 Kings 2 verse 31 says of him, just like it does of Judas. His blood would be upon his house and upon his children forever, just like it would be for Judas. He would be buried in his own land, out in the wilderness, it says, just like Judas was buried in the plot of land that he bought, as opposed, for example, to his brother Asahel, who was buried in the family tomb. Let his bishopric, another take. And Beniah was the man who would replace Job in his room. Completely self-seeking. We read 2 Samuel 18 and verse 13, Thou thyself, Job, wouldn't have defended me to the king if I'd killed Absalom. Judas, exactly the same. Why wasn't this money taken and given to the poor? Sorry, this spikenard taken, sold for money, and the money given to the poor and a character that never, ever changed. There's the three references at the bottom of the screen to the sons of Zeruiah who were too hard for David. Throughout the entire length of the life of David, that character never changed. Though he was in contact with a man after God's own heart, it didn't affect him one iota. And the same with Judas. John 6, verse 70. Haven't I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Almost nothing the Lord did would have an impact on Judas. When it finally came to it, it was all about self-interest. And that was Job, you see. A man who supported a Christadelphian cause for all the wrong reasons. And therefore, who Christ could never use. And frankly, nor could or nor should any ecclesia. Job's like a hand grenade. And the minute you take your hand off him, off of squeezing him and keeping him under control, he will blow up in your face. Because if he doesn't agree with what you're doing, everything's going to come to pieces and the fur is going to fly, isn't it? But he will support the cause. 
It might be your ecclesia. It might be your family. It might be a prominent individual. It might be a Christadelphian school. It might be one of the other organs of the brotherhood. He will support that till his death, uh, but in all the wrong ways. And therefore, in fact, a man like Joab, though he, in a carnal sense, might appear to be extremely useful in a godly sense, has really got no great part in ecclesial life and certainly no part in the life to come.